Nissan's year of the truck is a crucial one for the company's plans going forward not to mention its strong presence in the urban SUV segment with the all-new cash car. Nissan is trying to win over truck enthusiasts with products that have cargo and towing capabilities to be both workhorses and recreational tools at the same time. With the help of Boatsmart Canada, a recent presentation involving four of the brand's most important truck models took place in the beautiful Muskoka region north of Toronto. Auto123.com was on hand to put to the test the 2017 Pathfinder and Armada SUVs as well as the new 2017 Titan and Titan XT pickups. We towed and launched in a water fishing boat, a 23 feet pleasure boat and even a pontoon. Here's what you need to know Nissan Pathfinder. This mid-size SUV boasts modern looks, a very spacious cabin with seating for seven, a healthy V6 developing 284 horsepower and 259 pounds FT of torque, 6,000 pounds of towing capacity and a 4WD lock function for low-speed maneuvers. Nissan Armada Motivated by a potent 5.6 LV8 rated at 390 horsepower and 394 pounds FT of torque, and blessed with a smooth 7-speed automatic transmission, Nissan's full-size SUV offers a ton of room for second and third row occupants along with a great ride quality. Solidly built, it can tow up to 8,500 pounds, which is more than the Toyota Sequoia can, 7,100 pounds equal to the Chevrolet Tahoe and GMC Yukon, but less than the new Ford Expedition, 9,300 pounds. Nissan Titan and Titan XT. Here are two large pickups featuring a vast and refined cabin. Maximum towing capacity announced to 9,770 pounds, gasoline V8, and 12,010 pounds, diesel V8, respectively. You won't find a better limited vehicle warranty, 5 years 160,000 kilometers, in this segment. Comfortable on the road, they'll make your life easy with available systems such as integrated trailer brake control, trailer sway control, remote trailer light check until descent control. The last time I was at NAS Nissan a few months ago, the lads were telling me about the new Micra. Their tone of voice suggested huge anticipation. Word filtering through was that it was deadly as one of the lads put it. Nissan retailers have every good reason to get excited about a new Micra. For a number of years it was their highest selling car, before the cash cry came along and took over that mental. Anyway the fateful day arrived and last Thursday morning I found myself behind the wheel of a brand new Micra. A couple of things to say, it replaces both the old Micra and the Nissan Note which was traditionally a little bit bigger than the Micra. That's because the new Micra is significantly bigger than the old one, and possibly even bigger than the Note. It's a sporty looking number, and the one thing that struck me was the possibility that it could well become a favorite of the boy racer types, in the same way that the Honda Civic did. Looks wise, it's kinda going in that direction. The engine was interesting. The one I drove had a 0.9-liter petrol engine which, at low revs, gives you the same performance as you used to get from the older Micras, which is to say, something that would be reassuring to the traditional Micra driver. However, this engine also has a turbo attached, with the result that if you have a heavy foot, then this car will do what somebody with a heavy foot wants it to do when the rev counter goes north of 2500 RPMs. It's possible that this wasn't planned, but they've managed to satisfy both markets, the sedate and the less responsible. Driving the car was interesting. It's full of the kind of gadgetry you'd expect these days. While much of it is becoming standard enough, two particular innovations interested me. The first was the lane departure warnings which makes the steering wheel vibrate on the side of the car that is veering at the lane. The second, and better one is a red light in your wing mirror which lights up, and one on the dash also, when there's a car passing you but which might be in your blind spot. That's a particularly good innovation because I think it's fair to assume that none of us have made it through our driving careers without at least once falling foul of that blind spot. Another thing I noticed was that it for a small car, although far from the smallest car I've driven, it feels very very solid on the road. 
The steering was reassuringly heavy and there was very little sway as I floored it around a roundabout. This is a solid car with a good suspension. It's solidly built and comfortable to drive. You know that famous question, if you had to take it for a spin for a weekend in Kerry, would you be happy? Well, yes, I would. I'd imagine it'll be comfortable and fun to drive. All of which makes it interesting that the brochure never mentions neither available engines nor the driving experience. After the thematic stuff about making it your living space and brimming with confidence there's a bit about the Bose speakers in your headrest, and the variety of colors you can get it in. This isn't a criticism, more an observation. Nissan has aimed this car at people who are more interested in the color, trim and gadgets, and who want a safe car, and who possibly aren't overly bothered by what it's like to drive in. Dare I say it, they're aiming it at young women. That's fair enough, they pay the big bucks for marketing experts, and I'm not one of them, nor am I the target audience. However, this car will have a market beyond that demographic. This is a good looking car, with Nissan quality and reliability, that will prove attractive to all sorts of buyer types. If you were in the market for something slightly smaller than a Golf 4 Focus or Civic, but equally reliable and comfortable, you couldn't go too far wrong with the new Micra, or indeed, with the XLA Pulsar, one of the best cars I've driven in any segment in recent times. Engines available are the 0.9 turbo petrol and a 1.5 diesel, which would be interesting to drive. I've thought for some time that Nissan currently has one of the most impressive lineups of any of the more popular car companies, and the new Micra is a worthy addition to that. Prices start from 22250 and go up from there to 25250 although Nissan also have their various discounts for bangers, so you'd probably get on the road for something quite attractive. Nissan's been teasing its 2018 Leaf for the last few months. Today, the teasers soldier on with a lesson in aerodynamics. The latest 2018 Nissan Leaf teaser shows off its silhouette against the familiar lines of a wind tunnel. It gives us a better idea of the shape of the Leaf's headlights and taillights, as well. If you've seen any other new Nissan from the last year or so, you've got a pretty good idea of what to expect on the Leaf. The teaser also includes a discussion of its aerodynamics. The 2018 Leaf is lower to the ground than before, cutting down on lift. Enhanced aero stabilizes the car in strong cross lines, as well. The whole goal is to minimize drag and increase slipperiness, and less wing resistance means more electric range. Nissan will reveal the 2018 Leaf in September. We've already seen its headlight, and we know it can be driven with just one pedal. It'll come with ProPilot, a system that's designed to hold the Leaf in a single highway lane for a period of time. The Veeler in 2018 Range Rover Veeler, named after the decoy badges used on prototypes of the first ever version of Land Rover's boxy ute in 1969, is Latin for veiled, a light motif whose inscrutable modernity hits you over the head with its rampant subtlety. This is the design equivalent of silence so intense it's deafening, a theme that carries from stem to stern in Range Rover's first mid-size SUV. Squeeze the Veeler's remote and its door handles deploy from a flush fit with the shield metal. Press the start button and a touchscreen silently tilts while two other TFTs come to life. Set it in motion, and the all-new, 2018 Veeler slices through the air with a drag coefficient of 0.32, making it the slipperiest Land Rover in history, while riding on an air suspension with a perfect 50-50 balance. In case you haven't already caught the prevailing theme of understatement, Range Rover reps are quick to tout that the new Veeler is an exercise in minimalism, reductionism, in just about any other ism you might ascribe to a Brancusi sculpture in polished brass. Long and low, flush and taut, the Vila looks remarkably balanced from almost any angle. 
a visual portmanteau that blends the top dog Range Rover's elegant gravitas with a touch of the smaller Evic's angularity. This newcomer's form factor exudes a sense of that thing you didn't know you needed, a certain Cupertino-esque je ne sais quoi. But the idea of elegance, at least in its abstract form, is far from my transom as I maneuver the Veeler down a jagged off-road course through a glaciated Norwegian valley near the Wagnerian Trollstigen Pass. My tester, a top-of-the-heap first edition version saddled with a $90,295 sticker price, rides on massive 22-inch 265-slash-40 tires, visually beefy, but suboptimal kit for off-tarmac duty. Beneath the Veeler's pretty skin is a modified version of the Jaguar F-Pace's mostly aluminum chassis that's been reinforced for off-road competence and is further bolstered by Land Rover's Terrain Response 2 system, which orchestrates goodies like an active rear locking differential, low traction launch system, hill descent control, and an available air suspension with adaptive shocks, standard on V6 models all of which work in conjunction with stability control. The system maximizes traction by monitoring wheel movement 500 times a second, a feature which helps enable the Veeler's Billy Goat-like grip on the loose rocks below. While its approach angle, breakover angle, and wading depth are eclipsed by the more rugged Discovery, Veeler holds its own when articulating over uneven, steep, and dirty surfaces. Off-road aptitude is, of course, integral to Land Rover's brand narrative, and the Veeler's relative capability is reassuring given its supermodel looks. After all, what good is great bone structure if it houses a dumb brain? Also encouraging is the panoply of assistant systems, front, side, and rear-facing cameras as well as info including steering wheel position, the slope tilt of the terrain suspension travel, and torque distribution. Perform a water crossing and there's even a wade sensing display with a graphical representation of how close you are to reaching the maximum depth of 25.6 inches. If you can't be bothered to peel your eyes away from the view, key info is projected via the Veeler's head-up display. Merge onto the road and wipe the light dusting off the glass panel displays. And not surprisingly, Veeler plays the part of Boulevardier more convincingly. It manages small dips and big bumps with a level of composure closer and air suspension equipped Range Rover Sport, which is roughly 2 inches longer, bumper to bumper, than the Evic, which measures 17 inches shorter. Veeler rides large, with a view of its domed hood occupying a lower portion of the windshield's letterboxed vantage point. She's a big girl no doubt, but despite its 4,471 pounds curb weight, the four-cylinder diesel drops to 4,359 pounds, four-cylinder gas versions tip the scales at 4,217 pounds, direction changes take place with relative ease. That's thanks in part to its adaptable suspension, low-profile street tires, and a brake vectoring system that squeezes the inside calipers to help rotate the vehicle. The supercharged 3.0-liter V6's 380 horsepower, 332 pounds FT output can scoot Veeler to 60 mph in a respectable 5.3 seconds, but that acceleration feels buttery and predictable thanks to the engine's linear power delivery and the ZF8 speed's smooth shift action. Driving modes can be switched via the lower touchscreen panel or physical dials which double as HVAC controllers. While preset drive modes are easy enough to set, the bottom capacitive touchscreen also enables all parameters, engine, transmission, suspension, etc. to be displayed and adjusted at one, which might quell some critics who might resent the electronic interface overload. The quality of the screen image is exceptional, with crisp, vivid high-resolution graphics and pleasantly illustrated vehicle photography to support the settings, witness various versions of artfully depicted Veeler kissed with studio-like light. The vehicle's multi-function instrument panel ahead of the driver is sharp enough, 
as are the two central screens, but despite the relatively seamless integration and easy access to most important data points, there's something lost with the abandonment of physical gauges. The screens glow vivaciously in daylight and their seemingly frictionless surfaces dim to a slick, black blankness when switched off, but this digitalization marks the end of a great era of mechanically analog information transfer. Additionally, there's no haptic feedback when you touch those screens and sometimes, especially when G-forces interfere with the task at hand, it takes a double tap to push those small virtual buttons. The world's most glamorous brands, Rolls-Royce, Bentley, and Mercedes-Benz among them, have taken to fully or near fully digital displays, so it's no shock Land Rover has finally climbed aboard as well. At least the two real rotary dials take over some of the functionality and can be configured to control different functions. There's also a smaller physical dial allowing for quick volume or power adjustments. The interior of our first edition Veeler plays a convincingly plush mini-me to the range-topping Range Rover. With soft Windsor leather across the doors, steering wheel, and the brand's so-called full-width unbroken beam dashboard, there's a sense of specialness and luxury that's rounded out by an Alcantara headliner and details like cut diamond perforations, which form a subtle array of Union Jacks across the seat centers. Chief Designer of Color and Materials Amy Frostella says the pattern was greenlit after it occurred by happenstance, though there appear to be few accidents in the execution of the Veeler. Some choices are a tad trendy, witness the copper bumper blades and fender vents, but our tester also offered no shortage of lovely fashion-forward details, from the sharply carved Matrix laser LED headlamps to the flux silver satin paint, which is only available on first edition models, capped at 500 units for the US. Another pleasant touch is Range Rover's first textile trim to be positioned on the same level as leather, a hide-free option that's available as a no-cost alternative to the top-tier Windsor trim. Vaynert, a Danish company that has supplied high-end furniture manufacturers like Noel & Vitra, manufactures the wool polyester blend that feels and looks like an expensive men's suit. The polyester portion softens the tactility and helps with wickability. Early samples with a higher wool ratio didn't pass Land Rover's fogging test. The accenting microcloth is manufactured from recycled bottles but creates a convincing doppelganger for suede. I don't want to call this a fringe activity, Frascala says, referring to the alternative interior, because the fringe is starting to become the norm. Being a vegan or a vegetarian, nobody really questions that anymore. That said, when Land Rover chief designer Jerry McGovern approved the fabric option, he led Frascala's design team to a decidedly old-world source for further inspiration, his Saville Rotaler. The Veeler's subtext might be subtlety, but a recurrent thread is a shock of the new that, mostly, peacefully coexists with the comfort of tradition. Though we have yet to experience lower-end, higher-volume models like the base four-cylinder gas $50,895, four-cylinder diesel $57,195, or base supercharged V6 $65,195, the top-line Veeler First Edition knocks it out of the park as a both an instrument of utility and an object of desire.